anti-gravity. Quote, if at first an idea does not sound absurd, then there is no hope for it. End quote. Albert Einstein. The scientific revolution is considered to have culminated with the publication of the Philosophe Naturalis Principia Mathematica by the English physicist, mathematician, astronomer, theologian, natural philosopher, alchemist, and inventor, Sir Isaac Newton, who lived from 1643 until 1727. Newton published the Principia in 1687, detailing two comprehensive and successful physical theories. First was Newton's law of motion, from which arises classical mechanics, and Newton's law of gravitation, which describes the fundamental force of gravity. Both theories have been considered fundamental for centuries and work well independently of each other. The Principia also included several theories in fluid dynamics. The book is said to be the greatest single work in the history of science, describing universal gravitation and the three laws of motion. It laid the groundwork for classical mechanics, which dominated the scientific view of the physical universe for the next three centuries and remains the basis for modern engineering. After Newton defined classical mechanics, the next great field of inquiry within physics was the nature of electricity and magnetism, both important fields of study in the harnessing of anti-gravity. Does gravity have a magnetic counterpart? Spin any electric charge and there is a magnetic field. Spin any mass and, according to Einstein, you should get a very slight effect that acts something like magnetism. This effect is expected to be so small that it is beyond practical experience and ground laboratory measurement. But is it? Let's start with what we currently know in physics, and then we'll move to the theoretical. What is gravity? First, it is necessary to identify the two types of gravity. Gravity A and gravity B have distinctly different properties. Within the macro scale world in which we live, gravity B is the gravity we are all familiar with as humans on Earth. It is the gravity we experience every day. It is what holds the planets in orbital alignment around the sun that allowed an apple to fall on Sir Isaac Newton's head and keeps our feet firmly planted on the ground. Yet gravity A is what concerns us the most in this chapter. Gravity A, or what is called the strong nuclear force, is the gravity that holds the mass of protons and neutrons together in the micro scale world. Scientists have long thought that super heavy elements could have gravity A waves outside the perimeter of the atom where they can be accessed and measured instead of that field being strictly inside matter. At the turn of the 20th century, it was clear that although Newton's laws and Maxwell's equations were highly successful in explaining the motions of the planets and the behavior of light, they could not explain a whole plethora of other problems, such as why gases emit light when heated, why some materials conduct electricity at different temperatures, or 
why certain metals melt at certain temperatures. All of these issues require an internal understanding of atoms. In 1900, the German scientist Max Planck proposed that energy was not contiguous as Newton thought, but occurred in small, discrete packets called quanta. In 1905, Einstein took this theory to the next level by stating that light consisted of these tiny, discrete quanta, later dubbed photons. The photoelectric effect was the label for why electrons are emitted from metal when one shines a light on it. Today, the photon and the photoelectric effect form the basis of much of modern electronics, such as through beam motion sensors, lasers, and solar cells. The first law of thermodynamics in physics distinguishes between two kinds of physical processes, namely the transfer of energy as work or motion and the transfer of energy as heat. It describes how the existence of a mathematical quantity called the internal energy of a system operates. The second law of thermodynamics states that every mechanism or living being within a closed system will eventually exert all of its energy and cease to function. For cars, it could mean running out of gas. For a pendulum, it means losing momentum. And for life forms, it means old age and eventual death. Entropy is the amount of thermal energy not available to do the work, and also a measure of the disorder or randomness of the system. Equivalently, the first law of ther thermodynamics states that perpetual motion machines of the first kind are impossible. Of course, no machine runs perpetually since it is made of matter and all matter wears down. The way around this maxim is that the source of power remains virtually endless. Entropy itself can also be harnessed as energy, as in the case of auto brakes that add energy to a battery. The internal dynamics of the atom is the new frontier of quantum science. A nearly complete picture of the atom emerged after 1925, allowing us to peer deeper into the dynamics of the atom and predict its properties. Atoms take on the composition of miniature solar systems, but this is not entirely accurate. An electron orbits in a standing wave within an electron cloud, meaning electrons are in more than one place at one time. Everything vibrates at different levels because atoms vibrate, and that is because the subatomic particles are in harmonic resonance. Gravity is vibration in the presence of mass and can be neutralized by changing the harmonic resonance of mass. If you generate vibrations, such as the Tibetan monks levitating boulders, you can alter gravity. This is called auditive levitation. Another principle of physics regularly taught is that the state of matter has to do with the frequency of atoms in it, and that gravity is another form of electromagnetism but this is not the case. If we want to momentally amplify the gravity field, there are certain conditions that need to be met. The magnetic component of gravity, which acts as a bi 
material anti-gravity force along the z-axis sets the speed of light in the electronic structure so that it is equal to the speed of sound in the nuclear structure. What is matter? Our scientists continue to discover new elements on the periodic chart, but we do not yet have an accurate measuring system to gauge the age of matter. Scientists assume that because certain types of material, such as organic or carbon-based matter, seem to deteriorate eventually, there is a deterioration of matter. It is not accurate to measure the age of stone based on the measurement of the age of wood or bone. This is a fundamental error. In fact, matter does not deteriorate. It cannot be destroyed. Matter may be altered in form, but it is never truly destroyed. The changes in the complexion of the Earth reveal that mountain ranges rises and fall. Continents change location. The poles of the planet shift. Ice caps come and go. Oceans appear and disappear, and rivers, valleys, and canyons change. In all cases, for example, a rock breaking up in the surf, matter remains the same because it is always the same sand. Every form and substance is made of the same basic material, which never deteriorates or extinguishes completely. Forming new matter. When Bob Lazar worked in the S4 facility at Area 51, his task was to backward engineer the exotic propulsion engines presumably acquired from ETs. According to Lazar, the records, photos, documents, and crafts, which he actually worked on, contained antimatter reactors run by an exotic fuel using the mysterious element 115. At the time, this exotic fuel could not be found organically on Earth. When Lazar first spoke of element 115 as the necessary fuel that was used for manipulating gravity in space and UFO propulsion engines, there were people who immediately tried to discredit him and labeled this idea as a fantasy. But in 2003, Element 115 was officially discovered and given the name Un Unpentium, or UUP. Since then, several additional super heavy elements have been discovered. That is 113, 114, 116, 117, and 118. These latest discoveries provide significant credibility to Bob Lazar's assertions. None of those super heavy elements were known to exist in 1989 when Lazar's claims were published. <coughs> Lazar claimed that element 115 was the essential fuel used for manipulating gravity in space. He saw flying disks using amplified gravitational waves as the source of flight. He claimed un unimpentium was used in the drive part of the propulsion system and was in a stable form. Yet, according to Wikipedia, only 30 atoms of un unpentium have ever been synthesized. To date, four isotopes of element 115 have been discovered, yet none have been stable. Lazar made the claim that the U.S. secret government had in its possession 225 kilograms of element 115, but how they acquired it is unknown. If this quantity is indeed in possession of the government, 
The only logical conclusion is that aliens gave it to them, most likely from the reticulin EBEs in the technology trade Eisenhower forged in a treaty with the Greys. Whistleblowers have reported most of the modern USA secret space program anti-gravity crafts harness the gravitational strong force. This strong force field extends slightly beyond the atomic nucleus of element 115. By amplifying the exposed gravitational strong force and using antimatter reactor high energy and then directing it, it is possible to lift a craft from the earth and then change directions by vectoring the shaped anti-gravity force field thus generated. The key is element 115. Element 115. According to Lazar, element 115 is the key to manipulating gravity and producing anti-gravity devices, at least on the crafts he examined. This gravity A wave has amplitude, wavelength, and frequency. Being able to manipulate this field has significant results, including antimatter generators and anti-gravity devices. Lazar further explained that element 115 inside the reactor is bombarded with protons, transforming it into the element 116. Element 115, when bombarded with protons and heat through a thermionic generator, provided the positive voltage to run the ship, and then the gravity A wave was drawn off for use to power travel throughout the universe. As it works, the element decays and releases two antiprotons, also called antihydrogen, creating a form of antimatter. The antimatter is channeled down tubes where it reacts with gas and then undergoes the total annihilation reaction, which is the 100% conversion of matter to energy. The heat created by the reaction is converted to electrical energy by a solid state near 100% efficient thermoelectric generator. It is this energy that is used to amplify the gravity A wave. What makes element 115 so truly remarkable is that it appears to have a gravity A wave that extends outside of the atom and would appear that only the super heavy elements 113 through 118 have this extended field. It should be noted that scientists have not been able to find a gravity A wave outside of an atom from any naturally occurring element on Earth. But element 115, which is synthetic, seems to have its own field or its own gravity A wave. The gravity A wave emanates from the nucleus of element 115 and actually extends past the perimeter of the atom. Since this field protrudes outside of the atom itself, scientists can amplify that field as they are able to do with any other wave. In most nuclear reactions, scientists have worked with, they utilize fission and fusion. Fission produces energy by splitting atoms, while fusion fuses atoms, usually hydrogen, to release more energy. The total annihilation reaction that takes place in the small reactor which Lazar observed, was the propulsion system within the disk that could amplify and focus this gravity A wave. This would allow the craft to cause space-time to bend, much like 
space-time bends in the intense gravitational field of a black hole. This mode of travel is one of the two methods of propulsion that are used by the disk. In the first mode, the disk's gravity amplifiers are in the delta configuration and are pulsed sequentially in a rotational pattern. The ability to direct gravity to cause space-time distortion allows the disk to cross vast dis expanses of space-time without traveling in a linear mode at a high rate of speed. Within the backward-engineered spacecraft Lazar worked on, element 115 had a twofold purpose. <clears throat> First, it is the source of a gravity wave that is currently undisclosed by Earth scientists. Second, it is the source of the antimatter radiation, a reaction which will provide power. Inside the reactor, element 115 is transmuted to element 116, which is unstable and immediately decays, releasing antimatter. The antimatter reacts with the gaseous matter, which causes a total annihilation reaction. Bob Lazar's element 115 flying disks used to make the wedge for the, quote, sport model flying disc antimatter reactor that he worked on would have been the isotope of element 115 containing the magic number of 184 neutrons, therefore having an atomic mass of 299. Speed of light. Light is an electromagnetic wave. The magnetic portions are never conserved. A positive and negative charge, a proton and electron, each creates its own force field of electrostatic energy, not electromagnetic energy. Once this electrical field is put into motion, it creates the magnetic portion of the field out of nothing. Thus, the magnetic components of force are never conserved. Wherever there is a force field that operates at any point in that field, it is a function of how far away it is from the source. For example, in the case of elect electromagneticism, the force drops off as a function of the square of the distance. This field holds information related to the force. In ideal situations, this information travels at the speed of light. The speed of light is referred to as C for constant because it never changes when measured within a vacuum. As a matter of fact, the speed of light is not always the speed of light, but it is only so within a vacuum. This speed is not even related to the properties of light. Light just happens to travel at that speed within a vacuum. It's more than the speed that electromagnetic waves propagate throughout space. It is also the speed in which gravity information transfers or carries. Gravity and electromagneticism both travel at C, as this is the speed of all information propagation within a vacuum. Light only travels in discrete amounts or packets. But is there a limit to how low or how small an amount of light can be emitted? The smallest amount of electromagnetism that can possibly be emitted is a photon, or as Einstein referred to it, as light quanta, or a quantum of light. This is a virtual particle, not a real particle like a proton or electron, but it contains 
particle properties which become apparent in the photoelectric effect, which was the experiment that inspired Einstein. Light gets slowed down inside a glass or even in water. This is what causes light diffraction or a prism. Atoms are made of 99% vacuum. Atoms are able to absorb and re-emit photons, but every time they do re-emit a photon, it is in a completely random direction, not the direction from which it was absorbed. This is why only low levels of gamma rays and x-rays leave the sun. Most of it is thermal heat and light visible only to the human eye. The speed of light is actually slowed down by the electronic structure of atoms and is truly adjustable in a medium. In 2003, Harvard University physicists were able to bring light to a complete halt for a fraction of a second before sending it on its way. They could stop it permanently if it were feasible to keep the condensate so incredibly cold for a longer period. So the condition for making both anti-gravity and cold fusion work is by slowing the speed of light in the electronic structure to match the speed of sound and the speed of light within the mechanical waves of the nuclear structure. It is important to match the speed of light within the atom and the speed of sound within the nuclei. Once those conditions are met, the energy is thus able to transform fully from one form to another with neither to hinder it. Points determine the quantum structure of the atom itself where the speed of light and the speed of sound are equal. Thus, for the speed of wave propagation to change, because the mass stays the same, the magnitude of forces must be changing. Doesn't that break at least one of the laws of conservation? Well, no because we are not dealing with the forces themselves. We are dealing with the forces' magnetic counterparts. Electricity and gravity both have magnetic components, acting as an anti-gravitational force. All of the forces have underlying symmetries, wherein they have similar field components, even though the effect of the field component is very different. For every one of these force components, none of them are conserved, meaning it is possible to multiply the field of all of them many fold. And it does not break any laws of conservation because it is a purely local field. <clears throat> After all, we are not dealing with the actual forces themselves, but simply their magnetic components. A local field does not push against the whole universe like magnetism, but curves back onto itself. It is a closed system. Such a system does not break any laws of conservation, such as real magnetism itself. It is amazing that physicists have completely neglected to look at the magnetic counterpart of most all the forces, except electricity. Consider the seemingly colossal bonus that awaits an inventor. He or she could demonstrate the ability to produce viable low energy technologies because no laws of conservation apply. In cold fusion, we need to amplify the magnetic component of these forces and when you amplify one, you amplify them all. There is a 100% energy transfer during the quantum transition. Neutralizing gravity. Albert Einstein was writing in, there is a space-time vortex around the Earth, and its shape precisely matches 
the predictions of Einstein's theory of gravity. The gravity probe B experiment confirms the existence of gravitomagnetism, a force originally predicted by Einstein in his general theory of relativity. Electricity and magnetism can never be truly independent. A moving electric field produces a magnetic field and vice versa. This is the light wave, constantly switching back to and from electric to magnetic. In a bold attempt to directly measure gravitomagnetism, NASA in 2004 launched into space the smoothest spheres ever manufactured to see how they spin. These four spheres, each roughly the size of a ping pong ball, were the key to the ultra precise gyroscopes at the core of the gravity probe B experiment. The idea behind the experiment was simple. Put a spinning gyroscope into orbit around the Earth with the spin axis pointed towards some distant star as a fixed reference point. Free from external forces, the gyroscope's axis would continue pointing at the star. And in zero gravity, that fixed point would be forever. But if space is twisted, the direction of the gyroscope's axis should drift over time. By noting this change in direction relative to the star, the twists of space-time could be measured. In practice, the experiment proved to be tremendously difficult, but also tremendously successful. By May 2011, after accounting for persistent background signals, the results were announced and the gyroscopes rotated at a rate consistent with the gravitational predictions of Einstein's general theory of relativity. The results, which bolster existing findings, may have untold long-term benefits, plus the short-term benefits, including better clocks and global positioning trackers. Finnish scientists used electromagnetic fields to levitate frogs, plants, and other organic items in the 1990s. In a popular YouTube video, a frog is seen levitating using a, quote, 10 Tesla magnetic coil using diamagnetism, end quote. Biological materials containing water were the first items levitated, and then scientists went on to try other objects. Another video shows a 35 kilogram cannonball levitating. Indeed, laboratory experiments have allowed scientists to make at least a 1% change in the weight of objects. And that goes both ways. They can make objects about 1% heavier or 1% lighter. Of course, that is a long way from holding a spacecraft up because that would require a 100% change plus the weight of crew and cargo. Scientists have understood for about 60 years that the backward engineered craft they were studying operated on this principle. Underneath the craft are three objects that people have referred to as landing gear. They are not landing gear at all, but spheres within which a charged sphere is rotating. It is spinning on magnetic bearings. They are simply ferrite bearings permanently magnetized to the north and south poles. Our scientists have built them and checked them in the lab, and they work perfectly. They are relatively simple devices. The spheres carry an electric charge and spin on this type of bearing inside these big balls. The tilt is simply 
produced by rotating the sphere slightly, which bends the field. The entire process, however, is much more complicated than would appear, but these are the first steps which produce the end result, with several other steps in between. In short, there are fields around the saucers in order to hold them up, in order to produce the gravity differential and the time field differentials which are necessary to operate the crafts. Only gravitational waves can bend light. Gravitational pull theories use subatomic particles which act as a force a force of electromagnetic waves. Gravity is a force or a mutual attraction of matter. As we've seen, there are two forms of gravity. First, on a subatomic scale, particles are holding atoms together. The second is on a larger universal scale. These are the laws holding the planets in orbit and holding us to the ground. Gravity can bend space, distort or slow down time, and can even bend light. This is why we see the stars behind the sun that are blocked by the view of the sun, because the sun has such a tremendous gravitational field, it is bending light around its mass. All forces are interrelated. When you vary one, you change the other two. Space time and gravity are all interrelated. Altering the gravitational field is known to decrease time and shorten the distance between locations. Whenever you are around an intense gravity field, time slows down. If scientists resonate magnetic energy through crystals, and use the principles of amplifying the energy through mass densities, and then condense the speed like a transformer, it is possible to use the Earth's magnetic field as a mechanism to move mass or craft. This is similar to a reversed bumper car being repulsed, but the field of magnetism is created by the Earth. The key to space travel. With the manipulation of space, gravity, and time, a new perspective on interstellar travel comes into view. Vast distances in space can be traveled in very little time by distorting space and time, and amplifying gravity does this. Those who study UFOs say this is how the disc crafts are able to fly in outer space. Witnesses say that when a craft is hovering and viewed from directly below, it will appear invisible. That is, the light is being refracted around it and only the sky above it can be seen. Only when stepping away from underneath the craft can it be seen. A blue misty light is also usually visible on liftoff as a corona discharge because of the high voltage. Colonel Philip Corso, a high-ranking military official cited earlier, came clean with what he knew about the Roswell crash and other events surrounding UFOs, particularly the high technology the U.S. secret government was so eager to understand. Corso admitted he was no engineer or scientist, but he had done his own research and talked with experts. Based on his investigations, he made some interesting observations on how the recovered craft could fly. He stated, quote, The craft was able to displace gravity, through the propagation of magnetic waves controlled by shifting the magnetic poles around the craft so as to control or vector not a propulsion system but the repulsion force of like charges. 
once they realized this, engineers at our country's primary defense contractors raced among themselves to figure out how the craft could retain its electric capacity and how the pilots who navigated it could live within the energy field of the wave, end quote. With this discovery, only a huge amount of energy was then required. After scientists learned how the propulsion system worked, next was understanding the free energy system. With this knowledge, they could activate the craft itself and the free energy system, which was found to generate an enormous amount of energy. The energy could be formed into balls of plasma or a steady stream of energy. The system could generate the energy equivalent to a nuclear explosion from a range of 0.1 kT up to 350 kT, yet the energy system would release no radiation at all. The system could generate this enormous amount of power while never leaving even the slightest trace of residual radiation. This puzzled scientists. They figured out that when two hydrogen atoms approach each other, their combined energy level becomes multiplied through a strange bonding principle. It makes no difference whether the ions are positive or negative as they bond together regardless of valiance. It was confirmed that inside this propulsion system, something causes these strange, unnatural phenomenon to occur. Lastly, just before the gases are mixed, there is a form of light that is focused against the outgoing energy. This light is of a lower frequency. Normally, in accepted quantum theory, a small frequency means a lower energy. However, in this system, measuring of the lower frequency of light revealed an enormous amount of energy exerted upon the outgoing energy. Travel near the speed of light. The speed of light has a universal upper limit according to Albert Einstein's equations. Light travels at 299,611 kilometers per second. That's 186,170 miles per second. Distances between stars range from our closest solar system, Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years away, to a 100,000 light years distant to other stars on the opposite side of the Milky Way galaxy, to millions of light years between distant galaxies. The speed of light limit only applies to motion through fourth dimensional space-time. According to the theory of relativity, if a person climbs into a spacecraft and sets out from the Earth at a velocity close to the velocity of light, and travels out to Alpha Centauri, for example, and then turns around and comes back, people on Earth would observe that the passenger has been gone for around eight and a half years. According to the clock of the traveler who left, he has only been gone for a year. This is a result of time dilation in the theory of relativity. The spacecraft in which the astronaut is traveling is moving relative to the Earth at a velocity nearly equal to the velocity of light. The paradox arises when you consider that relative to the spacecraft, the Earth is traveling away at exactly the same velocity. Therefore, to the people on the spacecraft, who are relatively stationary, 8.5 years should have passed 
And by the time the earth comes back to them, it would have only been away a year. So it is clear that the very pre premise upon which the theory of relativity is predicated, namely that if A is relative to B, then B must be relative to A, leading to an impossible paradox. However, this paradox is resolved altogether if we recognize the variable nature of time. As someone moves around from one part of the universe to another, that person will encounter all sorts of values of time in certain given intervals. Thus, here on Earth, we become slaves to the clock to the extent that we believe that the intervals ticked out by the clock are time itself rather than our spatial perspective. So we find it very difficult to readjust. Multi-dimensions near the speed of light. Physicists state that dimensional levels are separated by 90 degrees. Musical notes and the chakras are also both separated by 90 degrees. It is a number that continually appears. The dimensional levels have more to do with music and harmonics than anything else. Everything in the universe can be viewed on an atomic level and can also be seen as waveforms relating to sound. Change the base wavelength of your consciousness and in doing so, change your body pattern to a new wavelength and you can enter into another dimension. Scientists tell us space-time is warping and stretching around a bubble of flat space-time, which is mathematically consistent with general relativity. This sounds promising, but the energy requirements seem to pose an impossible problem. Modern superstring and M-brain theory imply the existence of numerous additional dimensions. Recent work indicates that these additional dimensions might be much larger than the Planck scale suggests. For example, on the very dense first dimension are crystals and plants. Small animals and insects resonate in the second dimension. Humans and larger animals resonate on the third dimension. The Syrian and Hathor ET races are said to exist on the fourth dimensional wavelength. Near the top, in the ninth dimension, the wavelengths get shorter and shorter with higher and higher energy. Our entire universe may sit on a membrane floating in a higher dimensional space. Extra dimensions might explain why gravity is so weak and could be the key to unifying all the forces of nature. Perhaps it is possible to lift off the membrane universe constituting our four dimensional space time, move in one of the additional dimensions where speed of light limits may not apply and re-enter our membrane universe very far away. All of this is speculation, of course, but it is worth noting that disappearing in place, changing shape, or sometimes jumping discontinuously from location to location is frequently reported in UFO observations. Such behavior could conceivably be associated with motion into and out of perpendicular dimension. Just before disappearing, UFOs are uniformly seen taking a quick 90 degree turn. Perhaps slipping into an interdimensional wormhole is the trick to quickly transversing the universe. Astronomers have been searching for the apparent dark matter that is 
thought to be responsible for gravitational effects in the rotation of galaxies, the viral motions in clusters of galaxies, and other astrophysical anomalies. Perhaps there is no dark matter within our universe after all. Rather, the gravitational force of matter in adjacent membrane universes is spreading out and spilling over into our universe. In other words, other universes might exist just a tiny fraction of space away from our universe in one or more extra dimensions. This possibility allows experts to speculate that if extraterrestrial visitors are indeed investigating us, they may not be coming from distant star systems light years away in our visible universe after all, but rather from planets in our membrane universes that may be among us, but not visible from our limited third dimensional perspective. 